I love my church. I love my church. I love my church. Right before I went to bed, I looked at my bank statement and saw that I had $62 left for myself and my wife and, you know, left for us to, to live on over the next week or so. And um, I realized I, I just didn't know what I was doing. And the fact of the matter is, is that I tried to control every aspect of my financial life.
morning and welcome this morning. Thank you for each one that is here. Let's open in a word of prayer. And Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for, God, your blessings upon each and every one of us. God, I pray that you be with us this morning in our service as we gather together to worship you. And uh, Lord, we pray that you speak to each and every heart, allow us to grow in your word, and we'll give you the thanks for all you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Brethren, we have met to worship. Yeah. 
one more, the longer I serve him, the sweeter it Each day's like heaven, my heart overflows. Uh, well, how much do you want? 
But that's not what always the thought process behind giving is. Giving is so much more. When we talk about generosity, when we talk about what it means, uh, there's so much that we were created for. Uh, money is something man came up with at some point in time that we uh, produced in order to say, I'm going to trade this for your services or for something of, uh, of that value, for whether it be food or service or whatever it may be, uh, that's what we create. Uh, but you know what's more valuable than anything of all? And something you can never get back? Time. Yeah. You can get to the end of your life and no matter how much money you have, you can never buy another second of it. Uh, time is the most valuable resource in which we have. Uh, we waste a lot of time without ever even realizing it, and yet most of us say what? I, have, I never have time for anything, and yet we waste so very much of it. And I won't go into how much and what we wasted on, but we can, if we evaluate for just a few minutes, it won't take us long to figure out what we waste our time on, but we know what we wasted on. Uh, in many areas. But what does it mean when we think about being generous? The New Testament church, what I love when we think about uh, their generosity, it almost flips our entire world on its head of what uh, they did because they truly believed that Jesus Christ was going to come back in their lifetime. They truly believed that everything, when he said that he would be back, they truly believed that it was going to happen. Uh, so they went, and the church, uh, people began to get rid of their possessions. People began to get rid of uh, home. People began to get rid of things that they had. And everything they had, they began to lay at the apostles' feet. And they began to distribute their goods accordingly so that everyone was taken care of. Now, if a church began to do the same model and same principle that they did in the New Testament church back then, I said here a few weeks ago, people today would look at that church and they'd say, oh, you go to a cult. They would say, oh, that church over there, it's strange. I did doing things. I, they believe some funny stuff over there. But why were they doing it? They were doing it for the sole purpose that they could accomplish the mission more effectively. They were doing it for the sole purpose that they could get the gospel out in a way in which they felt nothing would restrict them because they knew that the message of Jesus Christ needed to go out because Jesus told them they were going to reach Jerusalem. He told them they were going to reach Samaria, Judea, and he told them that they would go into all the world with the gospel. And in order to do that, they felt like they could not have restrictions. They felt they had to go without the thought of possessions or things that hold them back. Because so often the things that we give for excuse of why we can't do things are the things in our life. Materials. And, well, I, I do that, but I've got this. Or I do that, but, you know, we've got this coming up or that coming up. And we always have something. And so you know what they did? They said, we're going to free ourselves of all the things so that they can accomplish the most important thing. Now, this message, before we ever even get into it, I'm not telling you to go home, put a for sale sign in your, in your, in your front lawn for sale sign in the, in the dash of your car and get rid of everything that you own. But the important thing is for us to evaluate in our lives of what is most important in our life, what is least important in our life, and take a priority of where they fall and see where the mission of Christ lies in that list of priority and say, where are we falling in those places? And are we truly accomplishing the mission of Christ? Is, is it coming in a, in a position of, of high priority? Or is it kind of taking backseat to all the things? And sometimes the things need to be reordered so that the 
most important thing comes becomes the most important thing again. And uh, so that's where we begin in, in Acts 4 in 32. What we see is, it says that the uh, full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And, and I like this. It says, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony of, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owner, owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had uh, need. Now, you think about this. This morning we began a new uh, study in our uh, in our Sunday school class uh, that uh, for for those coming in there of faith foundations, and we were talking about the uh, the purpose of why we're here. And one of the things that uh, the question that I that proposed to them was. Uh, how does the American dream sometimes conflict with the purpose of which God created us for? Now, what the American dream initially was, was for what? For us to be able to have a family and have a life for ourselves and uh, for someone to be able to pursue something for themselves and uh, have a career and have things. But the, the American dream has become something entirely different in, over the course of time. There is a clip, my girls watch just any number of things, but there was a clip from Finding Nemo, and I don't know if any of you ever saw this, maybe you don't have to watch all this crazy stuff <laughs> with kids, but there's a clip from Finding Nemo of these, uh, the, these seagulls, and they, they come in down and they're continuously calling out as they're coming down, mine, 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 mine. And I think of the American dream of what it has become in its current definition. That's what it is. I'll step over whoever I have to step over. I'll do whatever I have to do to get what's mine, mine, mine. It's not about preferring one another. It's not about who I can help. It's not even about obtaining more for myself so that I can help others. But it's about getting mine, mine, mine. And guess what? When I obtain mine, 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 you know what I want? More, more, more. But it's never a philosophy or a thought about doing anything or helping or looking on the needs of someone else. How did we shift to a mindset of materialistic thinking that says everything is about me, but never seeing those around us? And I'm, not, I'm not pointing a finger or saying we, it, we can all be guilty of it at some point in our life. You know what happens is we lose and sh our focus shifts from a purpose that is greater than ourselves. You see, when our focus, when we don't lift him up, when we don't lift Jesus Christ above all and understand that the greatest mission, when he, it, we see that we lifting him up and we understand that he looked on others and he put others in a position where that he saw those needs, the problem is we don't see anybody else's needs anymore. A couple weeks ago, we looked at those around us and we said I, I'm going to try to get and tear down the fences and I'm going to try to get into other people's yards to be able to see what others needs are you know the problem is sometimes we get to a place we don't care about what's in other people's yards anymore we don't care about their needs it's only about well I want to build me a fence you see what they did in the first century church they sold their fence they sold their house they sold their lands. You know why they were able to do the mission of Christ? I love this. He says, well, if I sell everything, I won't have anything. My favorite verse in that whole thing is, it says, there wasn't a needy person among them. 
Could we look among our own crowd within the wall? Most of these messages have been looking outside the church and saying, how are we going to reach people outside the church? But can I ask you something this morning? And I, I don't, we, nobody raised their hand and say, it's me. But could we, could you think around our church, and don't, don't speak out loud, please, but could you think around our church for just a moment and say, do we have a needy person sitting within the walls of our church? And here's the question, do we even know? You know what I love most about this? They not only knew, but they said there wasn't a needy person among them. Nobody had need because all their needs were met. I love this. The generosity was so great among the first century church that they said, the apostles, the leaders among them said, if you will be generous in the church, we'll make sure that every need among our people are always met. There won't be a needy person in the church because as long as there's not a needy person among the church, as long as we make sure that our people are taken care of, you know what they can focus on? They won't be thinking about whether they're hungry or whether they're thirsty or whether their kids are going to be taken care of. You know what they're going to be focused on? Seeing people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. They're not going to be thinking about what's going to come next. They're going to be focused on the most important thing of all. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said if their basic needs are met. If the needs that they have in their life are met. He said they won't be worried about the things of life. They'll be thinking about the things of eternal life. I love it because no one among them was worried about here and now. They were worried about the hereafter and seeing their neighbors and their loved ones and the people that they came in contact with. They're, they're people that they knew in life and the world coming to know Jesus Christ. You see, what generosity is, more so than anything, it teaches us to release our grip. We learn that in verse 32. It says, no one of them, not one of them, claimed that anything belonged to them. You know what God is? He is to us the owner of all things. Because you know why? He created it all. And you know what we are? We're stewards. We're stewards of everything that God has given into our possession. We're the bank. You know what, when I put money in the bank, the bank doesn't say, that's mine. You know what the bank does with it? The bank is a steward of that money. Now, here's the thing. The bank doesn't, doesn't just leave that money sitting in account. They don't, they don't just stick it in a drawer and say, well, Josh put in $100 in this, and I'm going to put it in an envelope and seal it and, and put it in the, in the Josh drawer here. You know what they do? Actually... They, they, believe it or not, they, they, they spend it. My money goes in and then it goes out the back door. It's gone. It, it's, it disappears. They, my money goes in the bank and then the bank calls up so and so and they say, hey, Josh just deposited $100. Would you like to borrow $100? You know why? Because the bank takes my money and they make money off of my money. That's how the bank makes money. That's what a good steward does. A good steward takes what you have and they further it and make something of it. You, see, you remember Jesus told the story of the talents? What did the one person do? They took the talent that was given to them and they dug a hole and they said, Oh, I got a fearful master. And he buried it. He said, I'm going to take that and I'm going to bury it because I don't want him to be mad at me when he comes back. And he says, oh, you were unwise. And he said, I'm going to take yours and give it to the guy who did something with it. You see, some of us, we never do anything with what God has given to us. We're not good stewards with what the Lord has entrusted us with. You know what God has given to us? We are to utilize for God's glory. We've got to release our grip on what God has given to us. No one took 
what in the first century church, what God had given to him and said, this is mine. You know what they instead said? <coughs> None of this is ours. God has just entrusted us with it, and we just have to use wisdom and do with it what we feel the Lord would have us do with it. Now, that doesn't just mean, all right, everybody, you walk in. Right, here you go, here you go, here you go. No, it means using wisdom and believing. All right, not one of them claimed anything just belonged to him, and it was his own. So they used the wisdom. I love to see that they utilized it in the best way possible because what they did with it was believing and trusting, and God blessed it. What did God do? He added to the church daily. You know what they saw? They saw people saved every single day. Why? Because they released their grip. It wasn't just a financial thing either. But you know what? When we love money, what is my, the love of money is? It's the root of all evil we learned. It's not just it's not just money is, it's loving it. But you see, that's the that's the heart of another issue. When we aren't generous in one area, we're not generous in other areas. I said, what is the most valuable resource we have? Our time. See, if we're not generous in one area, we're not generous in a lot of other areas. What were, the, what were they most generous with? Their time. Because what did they spend their lives doing? They gave their lives doing it. They gave their lives to the cause of Christ. They gave their lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They gave their lives ministering above all else, ministering for him. They released their grips not only on financial stuff. They didn't care about finance because they'd already released their lives in one most important and critical area. They said, here is my life, Lord. Take it. Use me, Lord. Wherever you want to send me, whatever you want to do with me, I truly believe that, Lord, you're going to use me to reach the world with the gospel. They believe that God was going to send them and use them. So loving our church is beyond the areas of outside the church, but sometimes we have to look inward and seeing the things that are right here among us. I love that they knew that there was none that are needy. There was not a needy person among them. When I talk about the fences that we have up, sometimes it means getting to know the people among us. I said not to shout out, I'm the needy person. But the question is, how well do we know the people that sit right here in the very pews week after week within the walls of our church? Sometimes we say to ourselves, I don't understand. Sometimes they're sometimes they're hot, sometimes they're here all the time, and then they, then they fall off and they, I, we don't see them for a long time. We say, you know, I don't understand. They have this, and they I, I look at their lives and, and they just they're not they they just don't get involved like they should, or they're not doing and I hear, I've heard excuses, I've heard people judge, and then I've heard excuses. I've heard it from both ends of the, of the, of the spectrum. But you know what I fail to see is the people that sit by ever get into the lives of that person to find out, is there a need? Maybe there's something keeping that person from getting on the mission of Jesus Christ. Maybe there's something in their home. Maybe there's, maybe there's things that are keeping them from doing the things that God wants them to do. One of the things we heard in our Sunday school class, you know what sometimes is so hard for people in certain stages of life to serve God? Those kids that you prayed about for so long to have in your life, and some people just don't want to admit it because I'll tell you what, it's hard to say my kids are keeping me from serving God because, you know, you love them and you pray for them and you wanted them in your life. And now, you know what those things do? They make it hard for you to get to church. They make it hard to keep you in church. They make it hard for you to serve and be in places because 
every single thing is a battle some days. And sometimes you say, boy, I just wish there was somebody who had a helping hand. And everybody says, oh, it'll get, oh, it's just part of life. It'll be, next season will be better. That's fine, but it takes whole groups of families out of a whole season of serving God because we say, oh, just wait. You see, it's not always a financial thing. Sometimes it just takes time. How can we, how can we help? Then we got others on the other end. They can't be because of their needs. You say, well, why can't they? Because, well, they can't be here because maybe they can't drive anymore. Maybe they can't do <coughs> What can we do to assist? What can we do? You see, loving our church means meeting the needs, meeting the places beyond what we see right in front of us. Sometimes we have to get in the yard, get beyond the fence, and find out what the need is of the people. And I'll tell you one thing. We don't always communicate our needs. Do you always tell somebody everything that's going on in your life? When you have something, when you need help with something or something's, do you, ever, do you always just go up to the person and say, hey, I really could use some help with it? No, we don't. You know what we do? We just say, ah, it's just how it is. And we just, we never say it. When there wasn't a needy person among them, you know what they were able to do? They were able to get the gospel out. They were able to do these things because they had deacons who were waiting the tables and meeting the needs. They had the people in the church who were continually working and meeting. The, and and they were, the apostles were, were laying out and distributing as needs were there. And they were always meeting the needs because the most important thing was that the gospel went out. They said, these needs over here, they're, they're second to the gospel going out. Just meet the needs and let's get the gospel out. The question is, how are we taking care of the needs first so we can get the gospel out? I think in every church we struggle with taking care of the primary needs of the people right here within the walls. And if we don't take care of the needs of our people first, then we won't take care of the primary thing of getting the gospel out. The needs have to be met. You know what? Sometimes it takes tightening things up. Sometimes it takes us doing things and having conversations maybe we don't want to have. Sometimes it ask, takes asking hard questions. Sometimes it takes giving things all way. Just saying, whatever you need, I'm here. If you need the time, if you need resource, whatever you need, I'm here. This morning, I didn't know it. I didn't know how it all came together. But I told you a couple weeks ago. I don't like being. I don't like being. Like, I like Sunday mornings. I want to be here, but kids have changed some of that. But I like riding together with Heather. You'll see we're driving separately this morning. And I said, I told her, I said uh, this morning she was having a rough morning. None of you all probably ever have those. But she was having a really rough morning. Just, and the girls were actually were not being that bad. The girls were actually coming together. The girls were ready. But she just woke up and it was a rough morning. She'd had a headache yesterday, a lot of things. It's just a rough morning. And she said, if you want to just take the girls, I just need a few minutes. I said, okay. I did. But it was funny 
She wanted to go through and get some coffee at McDonald's. And a woman we knew was in the line at McDonald's in front of her. And she, I, I didn't know this till Sunday school class, she ended up buying Heather's McDonald's this morning, buying her coffee. And it just changed Heather's morning. It wasn't much, it wasn't anything big, but she had a rough morning. And that one simple little thing of somebody who didn't even know anything that was going on or anything major did something that brought Heather's whole morning together. And I thought, you know, sometimes God can work even when we don't know what is going on through our little things. He can take our small thing and use it over here. And in that moment, how in the timing, just think about an amazing thing of I took them and the fact that in the time she left and she just happened to end up behind that person and that person, for whatever reason, God used that person to act, to do that thing, to change her whole morning, to bring everything together. I said, God, please. Let us see the needs around us, even when we sometimes don't even realize what we're doing, to bring things together in other people's lives when they need it. And sometimes it's just a coffee. Sometimes it's something that may seem small to us, but it may bring everything together for somebody else. Because everything just may be falling apart for them at that moment. And it may just be taking a meal to somebody. It may just be something small, but it's something in our generosity. Loosening the grip means getting behind the fences of other people's lives. And it means getting involved in a place in their lives that says, hey, I'm here and I just want to love on you. That's what the church is. Because part of the mission of Christ and the gospel of Jesus, it's good news, yes. But it is also the compassion of Christ that brought us the good news to begin with. And the compassion of Christ calls us to loosen our grip, to take the love to those around us on a daily basis. That small thing this morning, it just brought it all home for me as I knew getting up here today, I was like, man, I thank you. I didn't know what I could do this morning, and that's what sometimes I feel helpless. I say something, but I didn't know how to fix it this morning with Heather. And so I prayed with her before I left. You know what God did? He answered. I sought the Lord. And you know what he did? He heard me. And he answered. Releasing our grip sometimes means hearing the Lord when he speaks and doing as he leads us. Let's pray, Father, we thank you this morning. God, I pray that we would see the needs around us. I pray we wouldn't wait until someone has to come to us and ask us, Lord, specifically, I need this, or Lord, I pray that we would see the needs around us. Because God, if we don't start seeing the needs, we'll never see the needs of those that are lost around us. If we can't see the needs, Lord, of our fellow brothers and sisters sitting in a pew right next to us who are struggling. Lord, I pray that you would call us to compassion, to love, to service. Lord, the church is, 
action. The church is, Lord, your hands and feet. We are not per perfect by any means, as we have said, God, we are people. Prone to failure, but that you have worked on and are working on. And God, I pray you would work in us this morning. We ask in your son's name. As we stand to our feet this morning, <coughs> the altar is open and we pray that I know the Lord has spoke to you. You can pray, of course, where you are, but be open to what the Lord would call and see the need.